Let's just say a quick prayer. Father, I thank you that you are here with us as well. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you that you are here. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So um, a couple of notices. Um, first of all, that we've got our Tuesday prayer meeting, our monthly prayer meeting this Tuesday at half past seven on Zoom. And the Zoom details are in the notice sheet. Thank you, Stella, again for this notice sheet. Um, Ollie will be back in action on Tuesday. He's had a lovely, relaxing time. So he'll be back on Tuesday. And um, just to ask you to pray for Jill, who ended up in hospital this week. She was in a lot of pain. Um, she had an operation, so she's recovering from that. Um, so keep her in your prayers. I'm hoping to go and visit her this afternoon, and we'll keep you updated. Okay. So, yeah, pray for Jill. Okay. Um, Natasha's going to do our short talk this morning, so I'm going to get her to come up. Morning, all. Morning. Now, when Ollie asked me to do the short talk, he says, free rain, I think, pretty much. So Jackie and I put our heads together and we talked about Ruth the short story of Ruth. So it got me thinking, and I went to the library, because I don't have a computer at home. So I started working through what I wanted to say. So this is what I've come up with. So I find it amazes me that throughout the short story of Ruth, Ruth does not quit. She never gives up and she keeps going. She puts faith in God and everything that she does. Now, Ruth's story is quite ordinary. Perhaps that is what makes it so compelling. She doesn't come from a famous family. She doesn't have great riches or great positions. Ruth is just a widow and one from an enemy nation at that. Nothing is going in her favor, but she's brave and her faith never wavers. And yet the life of a foreign woman who has nothing but nothing becomes so important that it includes in the Bible and her name is recognized in the lenience of Jesus. As you read through the book of Ruth, you won't find any place where God's voice thunders down to her as you might in, Bi in other Bible stories. No earth-shattering miracles like the Red Sea parting happens in her life. But what you do see is an ordinary and challenging life shaped by faith and guided by God she believes in. We can look back and see the mighty way her life was used. The short story that is that Ruth and a man known as Boaz gets married and then later are blessed with a son named Obed the grandfather of King David. Isn't it thrilling and fascinating how God makes things happen? All because Ruth never gave up and the odds stacked against her. She had her faith in God and that was all she needed. Now, as I was typing this, I started thinking about my own life and a bit more about my past history with religion and my history with before I became a Christian. So this led me down to my own path before I became a Christian. I was at the time in a very dark place in my mind with the constant bullying at school and constantly being sick because of my chronic health problems. Never knowing when our next meal would be coming from or if we would be kicked out of our home once more because we could not pay for the council rent. Then there was a rough home life with a mother who was struggling, finding work while doing what she could for us three children and a father who was never home, but rather at pubs or doing drugs. Don't worry, I've not seen him in nearly 10 years. My mind would sometimes take me to places I'd rather not think of too much. And from time to time, I did think life would be easy if I was not there. 
God has no place in my life or my mind at the time. But as many would say, I was a stubborn 12-year-old. I never did take that route, partly because I had a younger sister to look after. My older brother spent most of his time with my nan, so it was just us two. And let's face it, Sophie at the time was only about four years old. She needed me to take care of her, to look after her, and to make sure she got fed. And unfortunately, and I'm not proud of this, but it did mean that I had to steal from the shop time to time. Uh, Because there was hardly any food in the house. Things became much easier once my mum divorced my father a year after that. She then married my now stepdad. They had a child together. My new youngest sister, Lily, and my father, who is lovely and cares very much for my family, even if he loves rugby. But let's face it, no one's perfect. I also thank my neighbour, Sana, a Caribbean woman who lived three doors down from us. She was a force not to be reckoned with. She often asked my mum if she could take me to uh, the church in St Mary's in Ringma. I'd been, a call, I'd been there before, of course, with the girl guys on remembrance marches and the occasional church fate back in the day. However, I could not remember a time that going to church was an option in a family of mostly non-Christians. It was just not done. We had no time for God. So by the time I, so by that time, I must have been about 14 years old, experiencing my first voluntary trip to the church. Sophie had been dropped off at a neighbor's house to spend time with her friends. I had no other worries to think about. Now on that day, the pastor was reading from the book of Ruth. It was one of those stories I've not heard before. And, and I found myself wanting to learn more. So over the next year or so, I started to believe a little more in God and try not to steal anymore. It had become a very bad habit. I had no need to. We had food on the table at least twice a day and we had no worries about being kicked out of our home. I was allowed to settle into my school learning and even pass my GCSEs, if just barely. I do think that God was watching out for me and my family, even if I was not aware of it at the time. I was so grateful that I never quit. I like to say selfishly that it was all me that was my own hard work that got me to places that I never thought I could get to for example passing passing school I used to like this the song I did my own way by Frank Sinatra but the older I got the more I started to dislike the song it is God that put us where he needs us to be it is God that shows us the right and the wrong way to be it is also God that teaches us how to be fellow Christians and help us in the way, in all that we do for, for each other. So as I was learning through Ruth and doing my research, I take lessons from the book of Ruth. Here are a few lessons that I believe uh, that we should take from Ruth. Now, these are just my own takes. Lesson one. There is hope even in the most devastating times of our lives. Lesson two, the past is not our final destination when we trust God. Lesson three, we must be people of character even when we think no one is watching. Lesson four, God uses unlikely people for his purposes. Lesson five, Doing the right things often takes great sacrifices. And finally, lesson six, our past is not what defines us. As long as we look forward and trust in God, um, and that God is by our side. So I finish with a short poem, because I like my poems, and I find it quite uh, poignant in what we talk about. So this poem is called Don't Quit. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging on seems all uphill, when funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile, but you have to sigh, 
When cares is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure turns about when he might have won if he stuck it out. Don't give up through the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and fleeting man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learnt too late when the night slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure to an inside out, the silver tint and the cloud of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your hardest hit is when things seem worse that you mustn't quit. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Thank you so much, Natasha, for being brave enough to come up here and share your testimony, to be, for being really honest about what life was like before God and how God has changed that life and how God saved her in different ways. Thank you so much, Natasha. Let's just pray. Father, I do want to thank you that you saved Natasha. You kept her from making that wrong decision to quit, to give up on life at the age of 12. Thank you that you did watch over her. Thank you that you sent that lady, that neighbor, to take her off to church. Thank you that you brought Natasha into the church family, that you took her into your kingdom, and that you've been teaching her and encouraging her ever since. And thank you that she's such an encouragement to us, Lord. What a blessing. We praise you and we thank you. And we thank you, Lord, that you did the same for us, that you came into our lives when we needed you and you saved us. We thank you so much, Lord. We praise you. Amen. Um, I'd like you to just have a little chat around the table with your friends on your table about what stops you from giving up or who is there someone in your life that God has brought in at that moment when you needed it most? So just have a, a, a little chat around the tables about that. It's so good to hear some stories. I'm sure you've been sharing stories with each other of how you didn't give up, how someone supported you or by surprise, provided just what you needed at that moment. And it's so good, isn't it, to feel that God is watching over us and caring for us in that way. So we're going to worship God now with our first song. We're going to stand up and sing, thank you for saving me. So please stand or sit, whichever you prefer.
Lord, that's all we can say, really. Thank you. And it's not enough, but we do thank you for your grace and your mercy, your forgiveness, your love, and the fact that you have given us hope. And even when things are tough, you are there, Lord, and you care about us. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to tidy the tables a little bit, just the plates, keep your cups and do top up your coffee as well. I've got some time to do that. <laughs> That'll be good. <laughs> okay. So if you want to settle back down to your tables and... Good to see you, Paul. You're right. Um, we might have one or two more join us, but we'll get started. Let's just pray for Paul as he goes out and Stella and Richard. Father, we thank you for little Paul. And we thank you for Stella and Richard, um, faithfully serving the church and um, discipling Paul. Pray that you'll bless him today and help him to learn a little bit more about your love for him. And we thank you, Lord. We pray that you'll yeah, grow him up into a man of God for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So um, I don't know if there's anyone here that missed the earlier notices. Um, just to say, we've got a prayer meeting on Zoom at 7.30 on Tuesday, our monthly prayer meeting. Um, also to say that Ollie will be back on Tuesday uh, after his holiday. And um, please pray for Jill, who's not been very well. So um, those were the notices that we had this morning. And the notice sheet has gone out, so the rest of them are on there. So let's just take a moment to be still. Lord, you are trustworthy in all that you promise and faithful in all that you do. You uphold all who fall, and you lift up all who are bowed down. You are near to all who call on you. You hear our cry and save us. We thank you with all of our heart, Lord. 
Amen. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song, I praise him. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to praise and worship him with two songs, one after another. So again, feel free to sit or stand and let's just really worship God for a few minutes. Continue. No matter what's going on, I choose to worship you.
Yes, thank you, Lord, that you see when it is a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. You see when it's difficult. You know what's going on in our lives and in our hearts. You see when we choose to love you and worship you anyway. Lord, thank you for giving us the strength and the hope in you. We bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Please sit down. So Pauline's going to come up and do our reading for us. <laughs> reading today is 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 to 16. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Jesus Christ, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep all this command command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ru ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Amen. But you, man of God, you, woman of God, you are called to be different. The Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy, a young church leader in a church in the city of Ephesus. And the, the letter was going to be read out to the church as well. So he was writing to Timothy and to the church. And he was reminding them that they are called to be different, not to be like everyone else. That's true of us too. If you have received Jesus as your Lord and your savior, then you are a man of God. You are a woman of God. And people can see that in you. They can see that God is important in your life, that he comes first actually, that you serve him, that you love him, that you trust him and that you follow him. They can see that you're a man of God or a woman of God. And since they were men and women of God, Paul urged Timothy and his fellow Christians to flee from anything that would distract them or lead them astray from God. Ephesus was a big city, a very commercial city. Lots of trading happened there. It was a port. And the love of money was becoming a bit of an issue a distraction for some, even for some Christians. Materialism was a growing problem. And there was some false teaching going around, a bit like we have today still, a type of prosperity gospel. They thought that godliness might lead to financial gain. And so they did things in order to get rich. This was causing people to fall into temptation and it was causing people to wander from the faith. So Paul was urging the church to steer clear of the love of money and of any false teaching that was going around. Paul earlier in his letter said that some Christians had departed from the truth. They were teaching things that took away from the gospel, things that took away from God's work. They were ignoring their conscience, Paul said, and as a result, they were robbing people of the truth. Some of the false teaching was very legalistic. If you followed these rules, you might be saved. It doesn't say that. You know, it's through Jesus and trusting in him that we get saved. But that was very legalistic teaching that was going around. And we see some of that today still. And also some of the teaching was very liberal. They were saying that God loves, God forgives. So you can live your life however you like. And that wasn't good either. And this false teaching 
was leading people astray. So Paul was urging Timothy and the church to flee from those things. And we need to be aware of false teaching even today. We need to be aware of anything that will distract us from God and lead us astray from God's ways. Is there something in your life that God would like you to flee from? If so, then flee from it. Avoid it like the plague. Give it a wide berth. Don't entertain it in your life one minute longer. As Christians, there are things that we need to be avoiding. But that's not what Christianity is about only, because Christian, Christianity is often seen to be something where we all have to make sure we don't do things. You don't do this and you don't do that and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. People in the world think that's what Christianity is about. But actually, Christianity is the pursuit of excellence. It's the pursuit of everything that is good and right and pure and beautiful. That's what it is. And that's what Timothy, uh, Paul urges Timothy to go on and do. Pursue those things. Pursue righteousness, he says. And righteousness is beautiful. It means that you are in a right relationship with God. There isn't anything better in the world than that. It's beautiful. And that then has an effect on our other relationships. Jesus said that if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. And we know as Christians that the only way that we can be in a right relationship with God is through faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross for us. Have you put your trust in Jesus? Jesus said, if, it says in the Bible, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. If you haven't found Jesus yet, then start seeking him. He's promising you that you will find him. Do it today. Don't wait. Pursue righteousness. And if you have discovered Jesus and you've put your trust in him, then you will have a new desire inside of you to pursue godliness a desire to be like God. Has anyone ever said to you, you're like God? That's what the goal is. You're becoming more and more like God in his character. Jesus showed us what God is like. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And how was Jesus? He was full of compassion. He was self-sacrificing. He was forgiving, merciful pure and holy, good, full of grace, but also full of truth. Are you like that? Is there room for improvement? I know there is here. But if that's the case, then go for it. Do everything you can to move forwards in that. Cry out to God and ask him to change your heart and make you more like him. Pursue godliness so that people can see what God is like through you and pursue faith faith comes from hearing the word so we read the bible we take time to listen to god we come to church we attend bible study take part in fellowship so that we can encourage each other's faith step out in faith and watch god act in response that will grow your faith chase faith and we pursue love. We choose to love people like Jesus did, in spite of what they're like, no matter how they treat us, even if they're our enemies. That's not easy, is it? But we do it anyway. We choose to do it anyway. You can't do that on your own. You can't do that with your love, because your love's a bit small. And God's love is so much bigger so we need to spend more time in God's presence and soak up his love for us so that it overflows into the lives of those around us. That's how you show God's love to people. And we pursue endurance. We're determined not to give up. Natasha spoke about that earlier. No matter how hard things get, and you know things are getting harder, aren't they, around us, what with COVID, the economy, war, climate change. It's getting more difficult to be a Christian nowadays and be outspoken about it. It's gonna get a bit harder, I think. 
but we're determined to keep trusting, to keep believing, to keep praising God anyway, determined to keep going, and we don't let anything stop us. And we pursue gentleness. Paul mentions gentleness. We're self-controlled enough to bite our tongue when we want to lash out, to keep our anger and our frustration in check. We're determined to have the patience of a saint, no matter how much someone has irritated us. <laughs> we decide that with God's help, we're going to excel in that area. None of this is easy, is it? You're looking at me thinking, really, Jackie? <laughs> It takes courage and determination. It's a struggle. It's a spiritual battle. In fact, it's an all out war. It's not just a military operation. It is definitely a war. We're contending not only with our own selfish nature and our wrong desires, but also with the wrong influences of the world around us and against the enemy of our souls, the devil. It's a battle. So Paul tells Timothy and his church to fight, to fight the good fight of the faith. That was Paul's rallying cry to the Christians in Ephesus, and it's his rallying cry to us too. Are you ready for a battle? Are you ready to be on the offensive and fight against those things in you that you know shouldn't be there, those wrong attitudes, that wrong behavior, those bad habits, those wrong beliefs? Are you ready to pursue righteousness and goodness with all your heart and strength? Sometimes the thing that we have to battle with the most is our own apathy, when we can't be bothered to go to church, or we can't be bothered to pray today, or we can't be bothered to read our Bible. Apathy is one of our biggest enemies. Or we might have to battle with discouragement, I'm sure all of you at some point have been discouraged. I remember my most discouraged moment, I think, was back in 2016 when my dad died, my husband lost his job, and my son had a breakdown all in the same week. And I was like, how can you do that to me, God? You know, that one of those would have been enough. And I was extremely discouraged in my faith. But I remember, I don't know how I found the strength, except it must have been God to walk around my living room and pray and sing. And I had a, a song that I call my fight song. Um, it was by someone called Natalie Grant. And I don't know if I'm gonna sing it, but I might tell you the words. I'll see if I've got the courage to sing it. It says, I won't let my fear resound. Chaos, you won't drown me out. Even the downpour is gonna hear my soul roar. Beyond what I can see ahead, be what, beyond what hasn't happened yet. Even the raging storm is going to know my voice. On and on and on and on. Nothing's going to steal my song. On and on and on and on. I will bring you symphonies, symphonies, over and over with every breath I breathe. Symphonies, symphonies, over and over with every single heartbeat. When I can't find the words to say, Teach my heart your melody. Sing my soul, sing my soul. Sing my soul, sing my soul. When I can't take another step, breathe in me another breath and I will bring you symphonies. I remember marching around my living room, singing that, determined not to give up. Determined. Have you got that kind of de determination? Can you find that? Ask God to give it to you when things haven't gone the way we hoped, when our prayers haven't been answered, or when we've been hurt by a fellow Christian or let down by the church in some way, that's when we need to be really honest and pour our heart out to God and ask him for help to forgive, to move on, and to choose to worship him anyway. Be determined to do that. That's what I want to advise you because that's what I had to do and he brought me through and are you ready to defend the faith to preserve the sound doctrines that have been entrusted to us so that we can pass them on to others Paul charges Timothy to keep teaching truth he charges him in the sight of the living God 
and of Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, as witnesses. This gives us some indication of how, how serious Paul thought this issue was. The life-changing gospel truth was at stake. And it says in the Bible that we are the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So we need to watch our life and our doctrine closely and persevere in them. We must guard the truth because the truth is precious. It's sacred. It's essential for the health and growth of the church. And it's essential for the transformation of our society out there as well. Whenever it's in danger because of false teaching, we need to defend it. It's a painful necessity, but we need to defend it. Are you ready for a fight? It's not an easy fight, but Paul calls it a good fight. Did you notice that word? Fight the good fight of faith. We know about bad wars. We've seen one recently in the Ukraine. Wars are usually terrible. They're not good, but this is a good fight. It's a noble and valiant fight. That word good can actually be translated from the Greek also as beautiful. It's beautiful when you become more like Jesus. I've, been, um, have, I've had the privilege of having Vera from the Ukraine staying with us. And I've seen how God has been at work in her life and how she's chosen to change her attitude towards some things because God has been working in her heart and she's been cooperating. And it's been absolutely beautiful to watch. You know, it's one of the biggest privileges of being a pastor is to see God at work in people's hearts. It's beautiful when the gospel changes hearts and when the gospel restores families and also rebuilds communities, bringing justice, hope and freedom. It's beautiful. And that word fight can also mean to contend or struggle like an athlete who is determined to win the prize. You know, athletes are disciplined. Some of you might have been watching Wimbledon. They didn't just turn up on centre court. They did a lot of practice before that. And they under, underwent some rigorous training, perhaps. Ollie, my husband, has been going down to the gym since January. You'll be impressed. He's been doing it every week, three times a week. There have been times when he hasn't felt like going. And it's taken some determination. But he's done it. If you want to see the results, you have to stick at it. So let's be determined to win the prize. And you know that prize is Jesus. That prize is knowing the living God. That prize is eternal life. And eternal life doesn't just mean heaven, does it? It means the life of God in your life now. That's the prize. Paul urges Timothy and his church to take hold of the eternal life to which they were called when they made their good confession in the presence of many witnesses. God had called Timothy. He drafted him into this battle, but Timothy wasn't dragged in um, unhappily. He volunteered. He responded to the call of God, confessing his faith in front of lots of witnesses when he got baptized. He also gave a good confession when he was ordained into ministry. And he gave a good confession each time he was opposed by false teachers. And he gave a good confession every time he was asked to explain the hope that he had by non-believers. And as Christians, we are called to do that too, aren't we? And it's interesting that in this passage, Paul mentions how Jesus did it. When he stood before Pilate, that hostile, unbelieving Roman governor, when Pilate asked him whether he was the king of the Jews, Jesus declared that he was born a king and that he had an eternal kingdom, a kingdom that was not of this world. For this cause I was born, Jesus said, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. This was his purpose, and it's our purpose too. Have you made your good confession in front of many witnesses? Have you been baptized? Have you declared publicly that you believe that Jesus has saved you, that he's given you the possibility of eternal life, that his spirit dwells within you, 
that he's forgiven you? Are you prepared to identify with Jesus publicly and to join the cloud of witnesses, including those who are now in heaven? There are witnesses as well. Just up there on the hill, we've got the Martyrs Memorial to the 17, I think it was, Christians in Lewis who stood against false doctrines, who proclaimed the truth of the gospel and who lost their life because of that. They gave their life for the faith and they are even now in God's eternal kingdom and they are our witnesses as we take up the mantle. We are called to take hold of eternal life, to know the living God. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. It says that in the Bible. You have everything you need to be godlike, to show people what God is like. We just need to take hold of it and be, to be determined to lay hold of all that God has given to you in Christ. It's a battle, but it's worth it. But maybe you are feeling a bit battle weary this morning. Perhaps you haven't got much fight left. Perhaps you feel like throwing in the towel, actually. I've read um, The Lord of the Rings again recently. It's quite a long read. Um, but the hero, Frodo, reaches a point of despair. And he wearily confides in his friend, Sam. I can't do this, Sam, he says. As a good friend... Sam gives a rousing speech. It's like in the great stories, he says, full of darkness and danger they were. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. And this prompts Frodo to ask, what are we holding on to, Sam? And it's a good question to ask ourselves, isn't it? What are you holding on to? What's keeping you going in life's battles? Let's hold on to the fact that good will triumph over evil in the end, that one day we will see Jesus face to face. We will be with him in his eternal kingdom and we will reign with him forever. It says that in the Bible, it's true. And in the meantime, let's flee from all that would distract us and lead us astray from him. Let's pursue goodness and righteousness. Let's contend for the truth and guard it until Jesus comes again. Let's take hold of the life that is truly life, not the empty things of the world. And let's fight the good fight of the faith together. And Paul reminds us, doesn't he, that we have the living God on our side, the source of all life, the eternal, glorious, immortal one. And we have the Holy Spirit to guide us and help us. And we have Jesus who fought the ultimate fight. He fought against temptation every day of his life. It says in the Bible that he was tempted in the same way as us, and yet he did not sin. He waged war against sin, and we waged war against the devil by dying on the cross for us. And he defeated death forever when he rose to life again. He is our risen and victorious king. So let's respond to his call, offer him our lives again, and seek his help to go on fighting the fight of faith, the good fight, so that we can glorify him and show others what God is really like. To him be all the honor and all the might and all the glory. Amen. Amen. I'm going to lead us in a, a time of prayer to respond to that and also to pray for um, other people. So let's just pray. Lord, I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes, Lord. Do not let me be put to shame. I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened my understanding. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding, so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes, 
and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning. I pray that you would strengthen them in the inner man with might by the power of your spirit. Give them courage, Lord. Give them strength to keep going, to keep fighting for you, Lord, the good fight. Lord, we pray for your church, for those struggling with their faith at this time. Build them up, Lord, and send them people to help them. Send them support and encouragement. We pray for those who are being persecuted right now for standing for the truth. Stand with them, Lord, and strengthen them, we pray. And Lord, we pray for our church here at Eastgate. Help us to show people what God is really like. And Lord, we pray for those amongst us who are sick at the moment. We especially pray for Jill. We lift her to you, Father, and we ask you to be very close to her today. We ask for your healing touch and for your deep peace. Surround her, Lord, with your love. We pray for our community, for those struggling with mental health issues who have pondered on suicide. Natasha spoke about that earlier, Lord, and you see them, you know them. Help us, Lord, to reach out to them. All those who are going through a difficult time, who can't feed their families, who don't know when their next meal will be, we pray for them, Lord. Help us to love them, to serve them, and to show them what God is like. We pray for our families, our friends, and our neighbors, those who don't know Jesus and don't have that hope that we have. Help us to be faithful, Lord, in sharing that hope. We pray for the world. Lord, we remember especially the Ukraine, Nigeria. We lift them to you, Lord. We ask you to have mercy on those countries. Lord, we ask that your word would go out and bring light and life in those places. Lord, have mercy, we pray. Strengthen our faith in you. Help us to fight the good fight of faith and to take hold of the eternal life to which we are called. Lord, may your will be done and your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously in the cause of truth humility and justice. Let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Thank you, Jesus, that you fought on our behalf. You have defeated sin and death, and you have won eternal life for us. We praise you, Lord, our Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's declare our faith as we sing our final song together forever. Thank you, Timothy. Do you stand or sit, whichever you prefer. <clears throat>
what we believe. We believe you are alive. We believe you are risen. And therefore, we will also rise. And we will be with you forever. And in the meantime, Lord, we fight this good fight because we love you. And we trust you, Lord. Help us, Lord, yes, in the fight. We thank you, Lord. This is from Philippians 1, verse 27 to 8. Whatever happens, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer my shield in whom I take refuge. Amen. Amen. Go forwards, you soldiers of Christ. Fight the good fight of faith. Amen. You can stay and drink coffee. Don't feel you've got to rush off. Um, there's no Tony and Joy though today, so if you feel like washing up, please feel free. Thank you.